Welcome back to 52 Lockup. I am your Apple Teeny Cadma, a bit in Apple TV. 52 Lockup is a series I started talking about one of my biggest passion, true crime. A new episode every Cad Maniac Monday for 52 Mondays, 52 Crimes. So I hope you guys enjoy. Be sure to like, leave some feedback, subscribe, blah, blah, yada, yada, yada. You guys know the rules already. I think the internet has been around long enough. And for this case, of course, viewer discretion is always advised. So for this episode, we'll be heading down to the state of Maryland. Everyone loves Maryland. I know I like to go out there, especially for the crabs. And we will be taking a look at Ray J. Sharif Black. Um, he was a young man who graduated from Coppin State University uh, with their bachelor's in nursing in 2008. Uh, he would attend Morgan State University for his master's degree in nursing education in 2013 and then would continue their education at Drexel University, which you know is a fave, um, for his post-master's certificate to become a nurse anesthesiist. And during that time being, they actually at September 2014, he would receive a congratulations from the Diversity in Nurse Anesthesia Mentorship Program with the school um, with Nick, uh, Nick Black next to him in the photo, as you can see here, president of the New Jersey Association of Nurse Anesthesiasts. Um, this is actually right before he graduated in 2015. He would become a licensed, certified, registered nurse anesthesiast. The acronym is CRNA. Um, so just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of what they may do, in case you may not know, a CRNA is a nurse anesthesiast who provides pain medication like anesthesia, care for patients prior, during, and after surgery. Now, anesthesia disrupts the messages going through the body, right? So it is a central nervous system depressor. So it depresses the central nervous system. Your central nervous system is made of your brain and your spinal cord. So, you know, your brain controls the things of how you think, how you learn, you move, you feel, you even breathe. Since the spinal cord is, you know, carrying all the messages to messenger back and forth, back and forth between the brain, you know, it's like, hey, this is what's going on. This is what we need. So the nurse anesthesiast takes care of all those things. They have to calculate literally the exact dosages to provide a patient, not only to make sure that they don't feel the pain during surgery or giving birth, they also are there to keep them alive. So they do have to monitor their biological functions. Um, and if they have to keep you alive for breathing, tube is going down your throat to make sure that you can breathe because remember this is a central nervous system depressor so that means everything is going to be suppressed even your most basic function like breathing so during his educational journey he would uh, meet what would become his future wife wendy natalie black who was also a certified registered nurse anesthesiast after the couple uh met they would eventually marry they would even have two of their very own children but their relationship would veer down a turbulent path, unfortunately. Wendy Black was an employee at Howard County General Hospital for nearly like five years, I would say, while Ray J held a nurse anesthesia position at the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Although he seemed like he was having it all, everything was perfect, right? But there was unfortunately a lot more going on than people had realized. The couple's relationship had walked down a path of domestic violence, which would lead them to their divorce. Now, Wendy filing uh, to the court multiple times her concerns for her well-being and safety for herself as well as for her children. According to the news articles quoting court records, it was stated that his ex-wife Wendy had filed multiple protective orders that were continuously denied. In 2020, Wendy would handwrite a note, which I'll place here, stating, I am terrified because I do not know what he's capable of doing to me and the girls. I do not feel that we are safe. I do not feel safe at all. I feel that my life is in danger. Unfortunately, these calls for attention are not always garnered the attention they need, especially for women. When the married couple divorced, a custody battle ensued and court filings and custody battles are you know, frequently utilized as a tool from abusers as another way of tormenting their victims. The custody filings between them begins in July of 2018 along with the series of domestic violence cases against Ray J. One of the domestic violence cases occurred even recently would be April 2020. And there was like a peace order filed in 2019, the year before, but that would be dismissed by the judge. And I couldn't find the resources to explain what had happened or why, but this is what had occurred. Now, there were another two cases that were filed um, that had dropped in July as well as September 2018 as the further back we go, right? Now, some may see this as a fickle filing, like, oh, maybe they're just going back and forth, but often the abusers and the per or the, the person of aggression will immediately want to like keep face, right? They wanna make sure that 
there's no uh, threat hanging over them. They don't want the police involved. And that could have been why the filings were fickle and going back and forth. Maybe there was hesitation on her part. We're not sure. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. So a woman I knew uh, was entering um, more of the more dangerous aspects of a physical abuse with her husband. Uh, when she had returned home with him after giving birth to their first son, he kicked the crib at her and bursted her stitches. When she had returned to the hospital, um, the medical staff kept asking her like repeatedly, like, how did they burst? How did they, I mean, they knew, they knew what was happening. They just can't do anything unless she says something, right? But she was so scared to speak up. Um, she just never did. And they had to stitch her back up and act like nothing happened. I mean, fear is a major controlling factor of what pushes people to do what they do, right? So that could have been why the filings were going back and forth. Now, to return back to Ray J, um, during this custody battle, he would venture out to actually date a woman who wants to remain anonymous, so she is unnamed, so we will call her Jane Doe. Now, Ray, Ray J would meet Jane Doe in uh, about like March 2019. But at this point, Ray J had what she described to be severe depression but he did not get the help that he needed. Uh, she commented that, you know, I felt like I was the only support system for him in a way, but I had to choose my own sanity. I had to choose my own well-being. When I broke up with him, I still loved him incredibly, but I knew that I had to put myself first. I couldn't be a part of it because he wouldn't get help. The former girlfriend shared a text message uh, Ray J had apparently sent her previously before, where she he wrote, there was a time that I was so low that I didn't want to live anymore. It was you that helped me get through it. She admitted she was not afraid of him and that she states, Jay never cursed at me. He never raised a, a voice at me. Uh, he always told me because of what I had been through in a previous relationship of uh, being abused that he would never hurt me. That's what he said to me. Unfortunately, their dating would end around uh, they would date until like about March 2020, right? You know, right up until the pandemic. But while all this is going on, during this time, Ray J was still battling his ex-wife, Wendy, for custody, um, who repeated herself to the court. Ray J threatened to kill me with a gun. He has access to weapons, guns, and has been known to abuse drugs and alcohol. He has pushed, shoved, threatened, and bitten me in the past. I am afraid of him and his anger and do not want him to know where I live. I am terrified because I do not know what he is capable of doing to me and the girls. Again, I do not feel we are safe. I do not feel safe at all. I feel that my life is in danger. Some may question, you know, why the difference in behavior between the two women, right? And immediately may blame the ex-wife for his behavior. Like, well, obviously she did something, you know. But the ex-wife is trying to remove herself from what is the threat. She's going through all the proper avenues. Abusers can be anyone, right? Which is what makes it so dangerous because you won't know until you're on the receiving end of the abuse. I mean, I wish I could tell you if you, you know, you have the right pair of shades, you can pop them on, you can see everything you need to, to know about a person and go, ah, that person's abusive. I'm going to go this direction. Unfortunately, we don't have that kind of technology. However, um... When it comes to abusers, they do tend to portray certain characteristics like frequently denying the existence or minimizing the seriousness of the violence or the abuse it, or its, its effect on the victim. This uh, provides control over the narrative and allows them to continue control over their victim. Their victims are seen um, more as property or as sexual objects for them. Abusers often have low self-esteem and often feel uh, powerless and ineffective in the world. They could be successful. Like he was successful. He was obviously very successful, but being successful doesn't uh, fix the feeling of inadequacy. That feeling will always win. Abusers will blame their victims for their behavior or I'm having a bad day or because I was drunk or it was high. Abusers can be pleasant and charming in between periods of this abuse to again control the narrative. It's just a, a vicious cycle, right? There are other signs, you know, when it comes to national domestic uh, violence, if you check their website and they stated like a ton of these red flags, which I will go through with you here. Uh, extreme jealousy. 
uh, possessiveness, unpredictability, a bad temper, cruelty to animals, verbal abuse, extremely controlling behavior, antiquated beliefs about the roles of women and men in their relationships, forced sex or disregard of their partner's unwillingness to have sex, not honoring agreed upon birth control methods, uh, blaming the victim for everything that happens, obstructing the victim's ability to work or attend school and live their life accusing the victims of things like flirting or having an affair with someone else because you know it's always the thief that feels robbed embarrassing the victim in front of others harassing them even at work demeaning the victim privately or even publicly i mean my god i'm sure you get the point the list can go on does it have to be all of those things no but those are the most common things that are found when it comes to those kind of abusers. So yes, this unnamed woman, Jane Doe, had you know a, a more of a positive experience, if you will, but how else would you make yourself seem like you're the victim of this ex-wife? How else would you control the narrative um, by making it seem like, see, this person says I treat them really well, so obviously I'm a very good person. Regardless of anything of their relationship, it didn't last past the pandemic. And during this time, before, right before they break up, in January 2020, Ray J would also sue the University of Maryland medical system because he was labeled a whistleblower, apparently following an incident where he accused or exposed a doctor for hiding drugs in his locker. During this investigation, Jane Doe breaks up with Ray J in March 2020. By April 2020, he would be terminated because all of his colleagues refused to work with him. Kind of weird. He also claimed that he was forced to risk his safety and well-being by working as a nurse amid the COVID-19 pandemic due to the job loss, which kind of doesn't make any sense, but it just seems like it's a deviation. Um, while being terminated, he decided, all right, I'm going to petition to be a child care provider. Denied by a judge, right? I must admit, I'm very curious about the case about the doctor supposedly, was he really targeted? Did they see signs of his problematic behavior? Like what was really happening there? You know, did they let him go, you know, on his merry way? Because I mean, we've seen that pattern before, right? Dr. Giovanni Becerra, Brazil, right? Dr. Ricardo uh, Cruciani, or even Charles Cullen, serial killer. I mean, were the signs ignored and that's why he was being conveniently let go? I mean, I digress, but anyway. Later on, he would meet Tara Labang, and it is unclear to like when exactly they started dating, um, but they dated long enough for her to actually become pregnant with a boy. So Tara also worked at the University of Maryland uh, Capital Region Health as another CRNA. Look at that, we're making a whole full team. But she also previously worked at St. Agnes where a former colleague named uh, Yule McIntyre uh, remembers Tara very well and describes her as someone who lights up a room when she walks in, right? Of course. You know where that's going once that phrase is said. Uh, and cared very deeply for others. Uh, Yule uh, stated she was a hard worker. She was fun to be around. She had this smile and this energy about her that when she was happy, you were happy. So now we're moving along. He's still fighting with the ex-wife. And now we have Ray J and Tara who are now starting to get into arguments, right? After he finds out she's pregnant. And Tara begins to worry about her situation, right? So at this point, Tara now decides because whatever happened between them, it's best if she has custody of the child. So I presume this was the moment where he feels like, again, he's losing control of what is his property. She did not want his involvement with the baby or the pregnancy. Ray J showed those signs that women fear and worry about when it comes to their significant other. And unfortunately, her fears would come true where Ray J would make the conscious decision by blaming his ex-girlfriend Tara for his behavior and he would shoot her and the unborn baby by sneaking into her home on December 11th, 2021 in Baltimore about 1.37 p.m. Leaves her house, um, goes 30 minutes away to his ex-wife's apartment because now he must have had her address after working so hard for it, which is about, I believe she's in Columbia, Maryland, um, begins a Facebook live confession to what he did to Tara. Um, I'm gonna just let this play. Uh, <laughs> so he says, anyway, he's just I just talking, right? He's like, I just shot my ex girlfriend in the head. Man. Man. I just shot um, my ex girlfriend in the head. Yo. Felt like a dream. Um, like, I like I never thought I would be that guy. I never thought I would be that um, guy. Shit has been real crazy. I can't go to prison. I, I can't so go to prison. The person, the person that, that really started, started my depression. My depression and, all of, and this all of this is, is my, my ex-wife. Ex so she's next. And then I'm going to do myself too. 
But I just wanted to say this to people. Don't play with people's emotions, man. Don't lie on these men. Oh, here's my ex-wife now. The video is disturbing because you see he's just, he's confidently waiting in front of the door and she unfortunately goes through. The camera drops as he runs towards her and unfortunately he grabs his ex-wife. He would shoot her dead after uh, gunning her down and he would shoot himself around 2.08 p.m. There are two children, uh, Wendy's children, four and five years old, would actually be found by the neighbor, Michael Eisenberg, who lived in the complex in the father's BMW, crying and just kind of confused on what was happening. Fortunately, they did not witness their mother getting gunned down. It is apparent people had contacted the authorities and authorities reached out to the other county to try to get him to get to the ex-wife. But literally, as they had already arrived, both of them would be deceased. Had it just been a little bit more time, perhaps maybe Wendy would have been alive. Um, it is too often that people do not take it seriously when people say that they feel like their life is in danger. Uh, Jane Doe stated that she was shaken up about the news. I mean, obviously, because she just dated this person during this time. And she even stated that definitely about protecting women, there's definitely a broken system. So here's another quote. Another quote. Just because there were a lot of court filings doesn't mean it's a he said, she said, right? And this is coming from Dorothy Lenning, the director of the legal clinic at the House of Ruth. There had been more than 3,600 documents filed in the custody battle. The most recent filing came from the week before, four days before Ray J. Black allegedly would kill his ex-wife along with his ex-girlfriend. Lenning says that abusers often use the court as a tool of control. So how did we get here? You know that, it, it, that's always my first question, right? How did we get to this point? Um, were the signs ignored, you know, like did someone see something was wrong? Was this just like, again, Dr. Bezerra in Brazil, the anesthesia who was raping his pregnant victims while he was dragging them when they were getting a C-section? Or Dr. Ricardo uh, Cruciani, who was intentionally increasing narcotic dosages to his victims, including cancer patients, so they would become dependent on the drug in exchange for sexual favors. I mean, there were complaints filed against both of them, and yet nothing was done. There was even suspicions on Charles Cullen, where a nurse was actually figuring out what he was doing, spoke out against them, and that nurse was fired so he could continue doing what he was doing, and eventually he was released to be someone else's problem. I mean, sure, Jane Doe states that Ray J had severe depression, but how did we jump from depression um, and then blaming another person and going to premeditated murder, suicide? So there have been several studies that demonstrate there is a relationship between narcissism and depression. One study found that nearly 29% of those with narcissistic personality disorder uh, NPD also had a mood disorder and about 7% of those NPD actually had major depression. Another study um, found that there was prevalence of NPD in those with major depression to be about zero to 16%. Of course, there is a strong uh, necessity for further research to obtain a stronger correlation between them. Narcissism involves a desire to meet grandiose expectations and receive external attention and validation. Narcissists will base their self-worth on these treatments, right? So if the accolades they seek are, are not received, then they may experience depressive symptoms like shame and isolation. Going a bit further, because narcissism is often the result of attachment disorders and a history of abuse or neglect, narcissists may also be more susceptible to depression. Despite if the person is presenting themselves as confident and high self-esteem, narcissists underneath it all, underlying it all, have a low, low self-esteem and self-worth, both of which are symptoms of, you guessed it, depression. That often go unacknowledged and untreated due to presenting quite the opposite on how their life is so amazing, like being a really successful certified nurse anesthesiast. Some articles state that there are six common signs of narcissistic depression. One, the damage to interpersonal relationships. I think we can see that with Wendy, right, and Tara. Um, hostility towards others like blaming and making accusations like blaming things on Wendy and Tara. Uh, suicidal ideation, you know, typically triggered by external events like telling Jane Doe, you know, he was at a low point of committing suicide. Four, hostility towards others like his significant others. 
five, temporary uh, alleviation of depressive symptoms through social contact, which everything looks grand. And six, underlying low self-esteem uh, or their low self-worth of themselves. So I'll be quoting a little bit from here from Dr. Grant Hillary Brenner in their article, Why Are Narcissistic People Prone to Depression in Psychology Today? Vulnerable narcissism, on the other hand, often arises out of childhood adversity, trauma, and neglect, evoking empathy and caregiving from others for a time. Vulnerable narcissists understand the idea of empathy, but expect it from others without seeing the, the give and take, leading to victimhood and disappointment. Those around them often uh, end up feeling burnt out, bitter, and finally just done. The authors discuss different theories connecting narcissism and depression. Narcissistic individuals may not effectively process feelings about themselves personally and regarding uh, social situations. Negative feelings get stuck, right? And they're just building up over time, wanting to hide their flaws, right? They maintain a front with others while inside growing more and more distant and depressed. Depressive states interfere with feeling in control and throw off behavior in social and work settings, further driving the cycle. So it's just one vicious, vicious cycle. If you know anyone struggling with depression, substance abuse, or mental Ill uh, illness, please look into samhsa.org or go to their national hotline, 1-800-662-HELP. That is also 1-800-662-4357. If you know anyone who is in trouble and dealing with domestic violence, please be sure to reach out. It is anonymous and confidential help that is always available 24-7. Call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. 1-800-799-7233. Um, I want to hear what you guys think about this case. I want to know how did, what do you think were the, the moments? Do you think people just ignore the, the signs and symptoms like it was with the previous doctor? or the previous uh, previous anesthesiast what do you think could have could have happened do you think this was vulnerable narcissistic depression that he was going through and this all could have been easily prevented um leave your thoughts in the comment section and as always stay vigilant and stay safe Woo